Okay, so we're, we're looking at how to prove that uh, the limit as x approaches 4 of square root function is equal to 2. And we did some playing around. We said, okay, if epsilon is 1, right, um, then that means that, you know, f of x has to be between 1 and 3. And f of x is just square root. So I can square through, get to here, and then I can kind of put things down on the number line, and I can work out that, okay, um, but, you know, I look on either side of 4 between the two distances. Um, this is the smaller, right? 1 is a distance of 3 from 4, whereas 9 is 5 units away. So I know that as long as delta is 3 or less, then x is going to be uh, in that range, and f of x is going to be in the range that I want, and, and everything works out. Now, um, so what we want to do now is say, okay, um, Given any epsilon bigger than zero, what happens? Well, now this is epsilon, right? This is epsilon. This is epsilon. So I get down to something that's going to look like this. I'm going to have, um, so we add two to everything. I'm going to have two minus epsilon less than root x less than two plus epsilon. Right? So everything's now in terms of this epsilon rather than, you know, like, so I can't actually simplify the number. I'm stuck like that. Um, but I could still square everything. Right? So I can square everything, and that's going to give me 4 minus 4 epsilon um, plus epsilon squared less than x less than 4 plus 4 epsilon plus epsilon squared. And again, I'm, I want to kind of compare these numbers to 4. But you can see that I, I have a 4 sitting there, right? So I can, I can do this, right? Well, except if I put brackets, then I guess that plus sign has to become a minus sign. Okay? And, and so what I'm doing here is I'm doing kind of the same way that I was doing that this was, was 4 minus 3, and this is 4 plus 5, right? I'm looking at those numbers, right, giving the distance from 4 on either side, and I'm saying whichever one of those is smaller, that's the one that I'll take, right? And so that means that I should take uh, my delta to be the lesser of 4 epsilon minus epsilon squared and 4 epsilon plus epsilon squared, right? I should take one of those. Um, I, guess, I guess, okay, if we wanted to be sort of pedantic here and allow for the fact that, you know, epsilon, I guess, could have been anything, uh, if somebody had to me an epsilon that was bigger than 4, um, then one of these possible delta values would become negative. Delta needs to be bigger than zero, so we'd we'd have to adjust things. Maybe we take the minimum of let's say one and and four epsilon plus epsilon squared, something like that. Maybe maybe you have to adjust slightly, right? We don't want to allow for for negative deltas, um, but we're okay here. Right? We want to think of epsilon as being close to zero, right? Um, the issue, of course, is that um, if epsilon were were too big, right? Uh, I, I might be in a situation where I start allowing negative x values. I'm outside the domain of my function, right? So, so certainly, delta can never be bigger than 4, right? Because otherwise, I'm, out, I'm outside the domain. Okay, so, so now that we sort of know what delta should be, we want to turn this into a proof. And, and if you wanted to sort of make this into a formal proof, you, you have to know a little bit about how these quantifiers work, right? The, the for any and the there exist, and how do you answer a statement that's written in terms of these quantifiers? Uh, so it turns out that there, there is kind of a, a convention, there's a formality for, for writing these up, um, which depending on, on your course and your instructor, you may or may not want to be asked to, to be this particular and pedantic about things, but if you want to get it right, you do something like this. You would say, okay, um, 
let epsilon be given, right? So we're just saying give me epsilon. Don't tell me what it is, just give me an epsilon. Just make sure it's bigger than zero, right? Um, so epsilon is being given. Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to say, let's consider delta to be the minimum of 4 epsilon minus epsilon squared and 4 epsilon plus epsilon squared, right? Whichever of the two is smaller. Okay? So the idea of showing that this delta exists is, well, I say, here's one, and I'm going to show you it works. How do I show you it works? Um, well, let's suppose that the absolute value of x minus 4 is less than delta. Okay? Then I know that minus delta is less than x minus 4, less than delta. So I know that 4 minus delta, so x is between 4 minus delta and 4 plus delta. All right? Okay. And so that means that, and again, you've got to be a little bit careful with the inequalities here, um, but we can sort of take the put, we can replace delta by either one of them on either side because, you know, delta is, is, is less than or equal to both of them, and here we're subtracting. Um, so it, if, if you're a little bit nervous about this, you could do this once with that delta and then again with the other delta and then combine the inequalities. Um, but what we get here is that 4 minus 4 epsilon minus epsilon squared is less than x is less than 4 plus 4 epsilon plus epsilon squared. And then we can say, well, that gives me that 4, or sorry, not 4, um, 2 minus epsilon squared less than x less than 2 plus epsilon squared. So 2 minus epsilon less than root x less than 2 plus epsilon. And adding 2 to both sides, we get what we want, right? We get root x minus 2 is between minus and epsilon and epsilon. So the absolute value is less than epsilon. Okay? And that's what we needed to show, right? We needed to show that if x minus 4 is less than delta in absolute value, then root x minus 2 is, is less than epsilon in absolute value, right? Um, the key thing here is that we were able to choose this delta, and, and, and delta depends only on epsilon, right? So it doesn't matter what epsilon is given, we can come up with the corresponding delta, and we can make things work.